Well, welcome everybody to um, session 7B of FRV 2021 on searches. Uh, my name is Brian Gainsler and I'm uh, an astronomer at the University of Toronto and I'm part of the CHIME uh, FRB collaboration. We have six talks with 15 minutes for each. Uh, two of them will be live and uh, four recorded. And for um, most of them, the, the, about half of them, the speaker will be on hand, hand to answer questions afterwards. So we're going to get started. And our, our first speaker is uh, Ziggy Plenus from uh, McGill University. So over to you, Ziggy. Thanks, Brian. Um, so my name is Ziggy. I'm here on behalf of the Chime FRB collaboration. Um, uh, I was a postdoc at McGill, but I'll be moving to University of Toronto's Dunlap Institute in September. And today I'll talk about new repeater, uh, repeating sources of fast radio bursts from Chime FRB. Um, so this has been discussed in detail at the conference, but the, one of the big questions in the field, I think, is if all FRBs repeat, and if so, if they all do so periodically. And we know that no fast radio burst has been directly associated with cataclysmic event, at least not in the literature. And we do know that there are some differences between uh, what we would call typical one-off fast radio bursts and typical repeater bursts in terms of their morphology. And there's also some hints that maybe their um, uh, host galaxies differ and their polarization properties. Uh, in terms of um, answering these questions, if all FRBs repeat, if you think about the populations and their repeat rates, uh, you might expect to find two extremes. One is if you really have two distinct populations of non-repeating and repeating fast radio bursts, you get something like the um, uh, distribution illustrated in green, where you have the one that just never repeat and then a large gap and then some distribution of repeat rates. Uh, whereas if they all repeat, you get some large continuum where uh, we do see currently a lot of prolific repeaters and we call them the repeating sources. And then we see some sources that are rare repeaters and we currently call one of FRBs. So to really map out the space, we have to both find new repeating sources and also constrain uh, burst rates of the things we currently think are one of FRBs. And so there's different strategies for searching for repeat bursts and uncovering new sources. Um, as we know, there's many more dim bursts than bright bursts from the same source. This is beautifully illustrated in this histogram from a paper by Lee et al, uh, looking at FRB 2012-1102A uh, with the FAST telescope. Uh, only a few sources have been studied in this great detail, so repetition statistics of FAST radio bursts are largely unconstrained. Uh, we do think most of them are non-Poussonian, uh, and uh, the bursts seem clustered in time often. So the strategies for searching for repeat bursts have been nicely lined out in this uh, paper by Liam Connor and Emily Petrov from 2018, is to either uh, revisit or monitor the same sky position. That's the approach that Chime FRB is taking. Just by its design, it has no moving parts, so it sees the whole northern hemisphere above declination minus 11 every day. And that's what I'll be talking about today. And the other option is to follow up um, detected one of fast radio bursts with a, uh, in one telescope with a more sensitive telescope. And this has been nicely demonstrated uh, with two discoveries by Kumar et al, one by following up SCAP burst with the Green Bank Telescope and one by following it up with the Murray Yang Telescope. And then similarly, Liu et al find repeat bursts with the FAST telescope of the FAST radio burst that originally was discovered by the Murray Yang Telescope. Um, so China FRB has already discovered a population of repeaters. Here you see uh, 18 of the published sources. Each row is one repeater and all the colored circles are detections at different dates. And there's the, the website where we announce new, newly detected bursts from all these published repeaters. And as you can see in this figure, uh, there's a wide variety of burst rates. This is also, of course, uh, declination and thus exposure dependent, but there we see wide variety where we see some uh, prolific sources like R2, the second repeating FRB and R3. We see them uh, quite often over the duration of our experiment and some other sources we only see uh, once or twice in a short uh, amount of time. Uh, recent highlights from uh, repeating sources from Chime FRB uh, were discussed by Moed Bartwash in his talk in plenary one about local universe fast radio burst. And then another source we've heard a lot about this conference is FRB 2020-1124A. And so this entered the scene only in November of last year, which is remarkable because as you can see in this figure, where I'm showing the exposure time over, um, over time, and the relative noise in the Chime FRB system over time, you see that we were sensitive uh, to the sky position and we have ob been observing the sky position almost every day um, since the start of our experiment. 
up till now. So we were sensitive to bursts, but still we only detected the first one in November 20, um, on November 24. And then uh, as you've heard, uh, the source entered a very high period of activity in about February and March of this year. We announced this in ATEL, and many of you have followed up the source since, and we've heard many great results coming out of this effort. Uh, so thanks everyone for that. And um, this figure is from a paper that Adam Lemon, a postdoc at McGill, is preparing uh, with the Chavez Free collaboration and uh, describing our detections in more detail. And then here's some links to more papers on this um, source. But uh, since I made these slides in the last few days, there, I'm already out of date, and there's more on the um, on the archive. Um, so I'll just leave this slide up uh, for you to peruse offline if you're interested in lessons learned from Chavez Free repeaters. And uh, today I'd like to talk about our efforts to uh, announce more uh, repeating sources of fast failure bursts. And we'd like to do this in a complete way. We'd like to um, be able to say, these are all the repeating sources in some time frame. So the way we do this is by clustering analysis. Uh, this um, analysis is led by Adam Dong at UBC and Alex Josefi at McGill. And the idea is that we look for clusters in sky position and DM from the real-time detection metadata. So every single pulse we detected since the start of the experiment, uh, we take into account time FRB systematic and statistical uncertainties in the real-time system. Uh, so this gives us a tolerance in clustering of about 13 dm units, about one degree in declination and about half a degree in right ascension uh, corrected for by the declination. Um, and what we use is a modified version of the DB scan algorithm if you'd like to, like to look that up. Um, and this analysis has rediscovered all published time FRB sources. And you see an illustration in the figure on the, on the left. Uh, you see here declination versus right ascension for some galactic clusters of, of events. These are unknown pulsars that were rediscovered in, um, in the clustering analysis. And then the, these are colored by the DM. And then the num numbers indicate that they have been detected as different colors of uh, different clusters. And so this clustering analysis, we've performed it on the whole database up to about May 2021. And this uh, gave us a list of candidate repeating sources. Now for all of these sources, we like to nail down their localization for all of the, sorry, for all of the bursts uh, that are contained in these clusters, we like to nail down their localization. We have three different methods for doing this that you might have come across in, the, in our papers already. And the first one is just to fit the per beam detection signal to noise with a beam model, we use this, for example, in the first catalog, and this gives, um, uh, for 68% of the cases, this gives the 15 arc minute uh, precision. And this analysis is led by Alex Joseph at McGill. And when we save the intensity data upon detection of the detection beam, but also of the surrounding beams, we can fit the per beam intensity data with a beam model. And, and this can give us a localization of a few arc minutes. And this is led by Paul Schultz at the University of Toronto. And then we can also uh, uh, save the complex voltages of the interferometer and then br brute force repoint the array to different sky position and look for the best localization. And this gives us a uh, sub arc minute resolution. This is described in detail in this paper by Daniela Michili with the Chime FRB collaboration. And the analysis for this uh, new sample of repeaters is led by Jerry Ng at the University of Toronto. So the next step in the analysis is once we've nailed down uh, the best possible localization for each event, and we try to, and we fit a best fit uh, dispersion measure. Um, we'd like to calculate the chance coincidence probability. This is very important in our case because we have a lot of events, and especially near the North Celestial Pole, the exposure uh, really skyrockets, and the um, probability of detecting, detecting two unrelated fast failure bursts uh, with similar DM is non negligible. So the way we model this is by uh, modeling the FRB detections as a set of independent, independent Bernoulli trials. And you can see the formula for this at the bottom. And then we correct for the total number of detections in the time frame. So um, to illustrate this, there's a figure on the left. So we have the total space of declinations and DM search. And then for two events, we come up with the best uncertainty in declination and DM, and we calculate this probability. And this uh, framework is set up by Amanda Cook at the University of Toronto, PhD student there. Um, so what I'll be talking about in the rest of the talk is just the sources for which at this moment, we are three sigma or more confident that they are not due to chance and they're real repeater sources and other um, 
clusters, candidate clusters are still uh, under investigation. Um, so if you look at the exposure and sensitivity of the experiment, um, and mostly the exposure actually in this figure, this is a figure from Pagyan Chala's paper from earlier this year, but um, population synthesis and understanding the scattering distribution of the catalog. Uh, but it has a very useful figure which shows the exposure as a function of declination. You see it really rises towards high declinations beyond the gray dashed line. That's uh, the, um, all those declinations we see twice every day in the podal and the antipodal transit. Uh, Chime is located at a latitude of 49 degrees. Uh, so our sensitivity is highest there which gives us a sweet spot of sensitivity and declination of a uh, sweet spot of sensitivity and exposure around declination of about 70 degrees. And this is also what you see uh, reflected in our detections of uh, repeaters. So the first uh, one plus eight, first nine repeaters uh, I've identified here with the red vertical line. So most of them are clustered around declination 70, which is not real, it's just an instrumental effect. Um, artifact of how the survey is set up. Uh, then uh, adding the additional nine repeaters, you see we fill in more of the declination space. Um, then this year we reported the repeater towards M81. That's one more source. And then uh, FRB 2020-1124A is one more source. And now from the clustering analysis, we find at least 16 more sources. So just a reminder, these are the 16 for which at this time we can say for sure uh, they are repeaters. There's other candidate clusters that are under investigation. So this brings the total to at least 36 repeaters. And you see we fill, mere, fill in more of the declination space still, uh, especially interesting, I think, is one source here at declination of about eight, which really brings us to the lower declination. And this provides interesting targets for follow-up also with um, um, Southern Hemisphere telescopes. Uh, so just some characteristics of some of these new sources. We see new sources that also show the uh, downward drifting suburbs that seem ubiquitous for repeater sources. There are two examples of downward drifts in, from two different sources. And then there's this one source. Um, I show two bursts from on the top right uh, that show relatively broadband emission. Um, so on average, we know that a lot of repeater bursts show narrow band emission. Although if you look at the repeater towards M81, this already has some uh, broadband emission and um, short durations in time. So I think this falls into some continuum of properties, uh, but it's interesting to see more sources like this. And then there's the source for which we have of order 10 bursts at a declination of eight degrees, uh, which, uh, which we only see a few minutes every day with the telescope because it's this low declination. Uh, but it will be an interesting target for follow-up observations. And then here's an example of a source at relatively high DM of uh, 1730 DM units. And the um, galactic contribution in that direction is only modest. I think it's about 70 uh, DM units. Um, so those are just some characteristics. We're analyzing the full sample and we'd like to present them to the, to the world soon. If you look at the Can detection... See? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you look at the detection rate first time, I'm showing here the number of repeater sources as a function of date. Ideally, I'd like to show this as a function of exposure, but we're still calculating those numbers for the duration up to May 2021. We have to take into account all the downtime uh, from, from the total system, but also from individual beams. Uh, in dark gray, that's the uh, time over which we found the first sample of eight repeaters. Then in the light gray, it's uh, when we found an, uh, nine more repeaters. And then uh, up to May 2021 is what we're analyzing now. And with the gray dash lines, I've just indicated when we detected some of the most prolific or most well-studied uh, repeating sources. Um, so there's additional candidates uh, that are subject to an internal scrut scrutiny. So there might be additional detections in this period I indicated here with the green box. So don't over-interpret these, these numbers. I've also not highlighted uh, what periods we were down, for example, due to heat in British Columbia or due to other uh, system issues. Uh, but uh, the takeaway is that we're steadily um, detecting new um, repeating sources. And I should probably say what I've indicated here is the detection is the time at which we detected the second burst from the source. So it would also be interesting to look at, for example, when we detected the third burst from each source, et cetera. But that's all work in progress. 
Um, uh, oh, I also just wanted to highlight another uh, one of the follow-up projects I'm involved with, which is uh, following up these sources with LOFAR. Um, so the strategy here is, as a lot of your strategies are for following up these sources, upon the detection of a burst with China FRB, we try to point LOFAR as soon as possible within a few days. Uh, and so you see each row here is a source in gray circles that are the China FRB detections, and then all the uh, color diamonds are LOFAR observations. Uh, we do detect some more bursts from our tree this semester. Very surprisingly, only two. If you look at how many observations we have in and out of the activity phase, um, and we also detect a new burst from every 2019-02-12A that will present shortly. And I encourage you to go check out Akshata Gopinath's lightning talk on lofar monitoring of our tree. And this is a continued project. Uh, recently, we looked at uh, R49, which is one of those new repeater sources, and we work together with our colleagues in the, in the Netherlands at Astron and UVA, together with the China for the collaboration. Uh, so to wrap up, um, work is underway to vet all candidate sources from a systematic and complete search for repeaters in the China for B database. This will roughly double the number of known repeating sources. Our detection rate seems steady, but I encourage you not to overinterpret these results right now because we will need to consider exposure sensitivity and configuration changes um, and we're working on a paper uh, about all of these new sources that we'd like to get out to the community as quickly as possible to encourage uh, follow-up observations. And also in, important to note is that active sources can still suddenly turn on, for example, FRB 20, 20, 11, 24 a so we should keep looking. Thank you. Thank you. Z, so uh, we can now have a few, we have some minutes for questions, so you can raise your hand or post in the Q&A. So um, the first question is from Jenny Wagner, who asks, based on the observations, would you say that the repeaters are homogeneously distributed over declination, or is the sample still too sparse to make statements? Uh, so along with the first catalog, we put out a paper that was led by Alex Giuseppe. It's on, up on the archive, and it's uh, there we tested for the full catalog if um, our FRB rate is isotropic, and it is. We see no hints of it being anisotropic or it avoiding the galactic plane. Uh, we did test it also for repeaters uh, separately, but the sample was very small. There were only repeater sources, uh, only 18 repeater sources. They also seemed isotropic, but I imagine we redo this um, analysis once we have the full new uh, sample of repeating sources. Thanks, Ziggy. A qu question from Jason Hessels. Uh, what are your ideas about why some repeaters suddenly turn on and become very active despite years of inactivity previously? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I suspect at this point we can speculate a lot on this. Uh, you, we might imagine that some of these sources have uh, long periods of inactivity, uh, where I'm thinking about years of inactivity, and then they suddenly become active again. Um, it also, yeah, similarly, it might just be activity in terms of turning on and off, but it might also be uh, the energy level might, might increase and it, it is undetectable by the, by the sensitivity of the telescope for a few years and then it becomes brighter for whatever reason and then we suddenly see it. Or alternatively, it might be the case that these systems are just born and very short-lived. Thanks, Iggy. Um, a question from Wen Bin Lu. Based on the 36 repeaters, can one roughly guess which scenario is more likely to be correct? Continuous distribution of repetition rate or bimod bimodal? Uh, that's something I, I'd really love to comment on, but we do need to calculate the exposures first to, uh, to be able to calculate the burst rates. Um, a, a question from me. Um, what, what's the future outlook um, for CHIME and then for, for bigger experiments like CORE? At, at what point uh, is the current tech, even the current technique uh, going to struggle in terms of chance coincidences and, uh, and the threshold is just going to have to become very high? Are we, get, are we starting to get close to that or the current method is going to work fine for, for you know, hundreds of repeaters? Um, well, it will definitely be easier if you have good localization. So I, I think it's fine the current methods as long as we save the complex voltages and we can get the roughly arc minute localization. Uh, that's one of the issues. So this will again be easier if you build outriggers and you can go sub arc minute localization for all of the FRBs. Uh, the other issue um, is that 
there's some ambiguity in the DM optimization. Um, if you have unresolved structure, you buy, your DMs are biased high. So if you compare a narrow burst from the same source, uh, like na uh, narrow width um, burst from the same source, you might get another DM from when you have a wide burst with a lot of structure. And then you might think, oh, these DMs are too far off. This can't be a, a real source. So that, that's another issue. But I don't think uh, as we improve our localization methods, uh, we will have a real issue. OK. All right, so uh, we're, we're, we're out of time. So thank you again, Z. Um, keep looking for a lot more from Chime in, in, the, <laughs> in the years to come. Uh, so our next speaker is going to be a recording. Uh, uh, it's a, a talk on Meerkat results by Fabian Jankowski. Uh, but Fabian is around, and he'll be on hand to answer questions afterwards. Hello, everyone. My name is Fabian Jankowski, and I'm a postdoc in the Meerkat group at the University of Manchester. Today, I will present you an initial sample of reasonably well-localized fast radio bursts discovered by the MIRTRAP team with a MIRCA telescope. This is roughly the progress from the last year of observations. This is the first MIRTRAP-related talk in this meeting, and so I will quickly introduce the project. Um, MIRTRAP is a fully commensal project at the MIRCA telescope array that consists of 64 antennas of approximately 13.9 meters in diameter. We focus on real-time data processing and transient detection. That means in particular that only candidate snippets and metadata are saved, so not the full raw data. We piggyback on all, all large-scale uh, survey projects that are running at the telescope. Um, that means we have a huge amount of time on sky and a large sky coverage, about 20,000 hours over five years uh, of the runtime of the project. Meerkat is a state-of-the-art telescope and has excellent sensitivity, as you have seen in other talks already. I give the performance numbers uh, for L-band on the slide. As part of Meerkat, we perform basically two surveys in one. One with the incoherent beam that has a relatively wide field of view of about 1.1 square degrees, and it has about uh, the sensitivity of parks. The second survey is with the coherent beams um, it has a, small, a bit smaller field of view, but it has about GBT sensitivity. The majority of observations so far have been conducted at L-band, with only a small fraction at UHF, and the S-band system is in preparation. Um, we are currently testing uh, via event-based real-time FAB trigger, uh, triggering. That means we will soon have uh, voltage buffer da uh, data available the results that I present you today are only possible because of the huge amount of work by many people. The MIRTRAP collaboration consists of people from five different uh, institutions and it led, uh, is led by Ben Steppers at the University of Manchester. External collaborators are the Thundercat team and the F to the 4 team. Now to the survey that we have performed so far. Here I show you an overview of the MIRTRAP survey coverage in galactic coordinates. We have spent about equal amounts of time at low and high galactic uh, latitudes, that means uh, on the galactic plane and off the galactic plane, and the average observing time per day is about eight hours. Um, the survey so far is heavily biased towards observations at L-band, with only about 10% spent at UHF and less than 1% at S-band. In this slide, I marked a couple of uh, fields with high exposure, such as the double pulsar, um, and the brightest and closest millisecond pulsars, J over 37 minus 4715. Other example fields are uh, some well studied fields in the X ray or optical bands, such as the Chandra Deep Field South or the XMM Newton uh, large scale structure field or the Cosmos field. And now to the results. This is the slide that I showed at the FRB 2020 meeting last year, where we announced our first FRB discovery. However, lots of things have happened over the last year, and we have been quite busy, to say the least. I am very happy to present you an initial sample of Meerkat FRBs. Here I show a rogues gallery of the dispersed dynamic spectra, pulse profiles, and spectra on the right-hand side. 
These will appear in publications by multiple members of the Meertrap team very soon. Additionally, we have discovered many new galactic sources that are currently being timed for those sources for which we have a sufficient number of pulses already. And uh, Tian is currently working on the first sample of galactic sources as part of his PhD. And his paper should be uh, finished soon. Now I will focus on these four FRBs first and will introduce their basic properties. They were all discovered in single coherent beams. Here you can see again they are dispersed uh, dynamic spectra, pulse profiles, and power spectral densities or flux density spectra. Um, these are the burst properties that I show in the table. They have DMs between 140 and 1200 units and excess DMs between 80 and 1100 units. By excess DM, I mean the DM above the galactic and the Milky Way halo contributions. They have birth, burst width between 2.4 and 22 milliseconds. Their inferred peak flux density is ranged between 40 and 170 millijansky, and they have inferred fluences between 0 0.8 and 1.5 jansky milliseconds. Given their excess DMs and assuming a distribution of host DM contributions, we infer redshifts between 0 0.1 and 1.2 for them. Some of the MIRTRAP FRBs show clear scattering tails in their profiles that allow us to measure their scattering time scales. However, for most FRBs, we are limited by intra-channel dispersive smearing at the low frequency band edge. That is because for most bursts, we only have 1,024 channels across the band. Fortunately, this limitation will be removed once the real-time voltage buffer dump capability is fully deployed. Additionally, uh, fitting the very lowest signal-to-noise FRBs is relatively challenging. Um, so this is why it's still a work in progress. The next topic that I want to talk about is the localization of the FRBs and uh, any multi-frequency data. As I mentioned before, these four FRBs were discovered in single coherent beams, which means that they are localized to about one square arc minute uh, or a bit below. The, the coherent beam footprints are actually smaller than uh, one square arc minute for, for three of them. In addition, we are currently trying to improve the localization further by incorporating information about their spectra, such as their spectral indices, into the localization software. On the slide, I show the footprints of the detection coherent beams um, and the localization regions from the non-detections in the other coherent beams. Uh, so the detection beam is in red, the localization region is uh, in green. For three of them, there is extant PAMSTARS optical data uh, available, and for the fourth one, there is uh, SkyMapper optical data. And um, as you can see, there are multiple galaxies uh, visible in the localization regions. Um, we are planning to perform path analysis together with the F to the 4 team to investigate whether any likely host galaxies can be identified for these FRBs. Now I will talk about another FRB discovered in a single coherent beam, which is similarly localized to better than one square arc minute. It has a DM of about 434 units and an excess DM of about 240 units. On the bottom left-hand side, you can see the tiling pattern of the coherent beams on the sky with the best fitting localization region overlaid. Uh, on the top left-hand side, you can see again a dispersed dynamic spectrum and a pulse profile in which you can clearly see a scattering tail and the spectrum again. On the right hand side, you can see a Gemini South R band image provided by the F to the 4 team um, with the local localization region of the FRB overlaid. The F to the 4 team have performed a path analysis and two galaxies were identified as potential host galaxies. Um, the path probability for the larger extent galaxy is about 98% and only about 2% for the smaller galaxy. So it is pretty clear which is the most likely uh, host galaxy for, for this burst. That said, there could be further galaxies hidden before, uh, behind foreground stars, so, uh, and the path analysis tried to incorporate that information. 
Um, and further, there are spectroscopic follow-up ongoing to basically work out the redshift of the larger extent galaxy. Again, this is uh, done by the F to the 4 team. In the same FRB that I just talked about, we might see something that looks like a faint pulse cursor pulse. I show it in the pulse profile here, marked by the red arrow, and you can also see it faintly in the DM trial um, versus time plot here. Um, it seems to occur about 200 milliseconds after the main burst component, and apparently has the same DM as you, as you can see, as you can see here. So. If the pulse is indeed genuine, it might indicate that this is a repeating FRB source. Alternatively, it could also be a subburst component from a wider burst envelope that peaks out from the baseline noise. So in any case, this could be an interesting FRB source. And aside from that FRB, um, we have seen no uh, repeat pulses for, for um, any of these sources in three to 27 hours on the fields with Meerkat. Uh, that said, we are currently performing a double check of the candidate database. So how does the initial MIRTRAP FRB sample fit into the known FRB population? This is what I uh, show on this slide here. Um, I compare the basic observational properties, such as the observed DMs and pulse width um, of the MIRTRAP FRBs with those from the literature that I took from the transient name server and that are augmented slightly. Um, and when looking at the observed DM distribution, um, you can see that the mere trap distribution is, looks initially quite similar to the utmost distribution and to some extent also the parks distribution. And for the pulse width, the same is true as well. Um, there are some, at least some similarities between these uh, distributions. And so, so what does this mean? Um, obviously, we are still very much in the low number statistics regime, and so I caution to interpret too much into it. However, it could perhaps mean that the observational biases or selection functions of the MIRTRAP survey um, is similar to the utmost survey uh, and to some extent also the PARC survey, uh, meaning also there are similar exposure properties maybe. Um, what you also see here is an apparent lack of high DM bursts, so very high DM bursts above 2000 units for example, um, even though we search up to 4,000 DM units or and even higher than that. Um, this could be because of observational biases in the machine learning classifier, that the machine learning classifier is actually biased against these bursts. And we think that because we have actually um, very good sensitivity to low, low DM bursts, um, because we have um, a, a sizable number of galactic uh, discoveries. Um, so we are we will probably reprocess all the candidates with a new and improved classifier. When looking at the fluence distribution, however, you see that the mere trap distribution is shifted to lower fluences. Um, it is roughly located at the low end of the parks distribution, as you can see here. Um, and that is expected because of the higher sensitivity of the mere trap survey in comparison with Atmos and parks and also uh, ASCAP. Uh, note that I only show the four, I show the distribution for the four single coherent beam FRBs here. Um, some of the other FRBs have higher fluences, so that would fill in some of the di distribution, but um, they have not been estimated carefully yet. This is why I only show the four here. So this is already my summary slide. I presented you a first sample of FRBs discovered by the MIRTRAP team that are well localized. I discussed their burst properties, their better than one square arc minute localizations. I showed extant optical data and the most likely host galaxy for one of the bursts. I commented on limits on their repeatability and the possible discovery of a repeat pulse in the data. Finally, I showed how the MIRTRAP sample fits into the known FRB population. And as I mentioned before, we have multiple publications coming, so stay tuned for them. And I would also like to advertise Laura's talk in the pinpointing session where she talks about our first arc second localization. We also got a late breaking news talk on Thursday, so stay tuned for that. And feel free to ask questions either here or in the Slack channel. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Fabian. So Fabian is 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 here in real life, and he is uh, happy to take your questions. Uh, so please ask them um, in the in the Q and A, or you can raise your hand. Uh, so the first question is from Ziggy Planus, and he says, "Do you have a degeneracy between beam response and intrinsic burst spectra at your observing band, or do the majority of FRBs span your full band?" Um, so it is. It is safe to say that most of the FRBs actually seem to span the full band. We haven't seen any um, that are basic, basically uh, limited to some um, small burst envelope in, in the bandwidth. Um, to the uh, degeneracy between, between the spectra and the uh, response of the uh, coherent beams, of course, there is a degeneracy um, if, you're, um, if you localize or if you um, Find a burst that is offset from the from the center of the coherent beam. You will have some um, um, induced spectrum um, from from that, of course. Um, yes. Next, the next question is from Shitij Agaval, and he says, "Why do you think that the ML classifier is biased against high DM bursts? Was it not trained with high DM bursts?" Um, we think um, so. We think mainly that, that it's biased because of the because we haven't uh, found any bursts uh, above two thousand uh, dm units, and uh, e even though we we regularly find strong uh, single pulse detection of known pulsars, and we have detected uh, many uh, galactic sources, and the um, bias could be that um, for the very highest uh, sources, um, the dm bow tie gets quite small. Um, so it's it's an Im image based uh, machine learning classifier, and um, it, it takes in the DM bow tie, and um, that actually gets uh, relatively small. This is why we we think it might be biased against these. So we are we're, we are trying to adjust the the classifier in in that regard and reprocess the data. Right. So any other questions for Fabian? Okay, so there you can ask more questions. Oh, question just came in from uh, Joska Jans. Uh, are you doing band limited searches as well? Um, no, we are not doing band limited searches because it's um, it's all real time, right? So we need to we need to somehow um, find a compromise between compute power that we actually have and what so, uh, searches we can perform. And no, we are not we are not doing any um, any any band limited searches uh, set such as uh, that are ongoing with the parks ultra wideband receiver for example um, we, we could think about doing something like that in the future depending on if it's computationally uh, feasible but it will be challenging last chance for any other questions otherwise you can uh, ask questions uh, in the Slack channel for frb 2021 plenary 07 all right, well, thank you for having me for your talk. Uh, so our next talk uh, uh, is from Yuri van Leeuwen. And uh, just the, the logistics of this talk is Yuri, Yuri is, is around, but he has a, quite a poor uh, connection. So he's asked if he can answer questions on Slack. So you can actually post your questions directly to, to Yuri uh, on, on the Slack channel, uh, or you can ask them normally, and then we will paste them into the Slack and wait for his reply. Uh, so uh, I will now hand over to uh, the recorded version of the entry to talk about Appetit. Hi, everyone. I'm Yuri van Leeuwen. You're seeing this recording, which means uh, the internet at my current place uh, isn't uh, fast enough for uh, this session. But still, I'm uh, proud to present to you today some of the latest results from the FRB survey that we are carrying out with Appetit. Um, Myself and the team will be in Slack, though. So if you have any questions, you can post them there and we'll be glad to answer them. So as uh, you can see on the left here, uh, Aperitif is the uh, extension, the phased array feed upgrade to Westerbork that uh, increased the field of view from the old field of about half by half uh, degree on the sky. You can see that in the little dashed circle in the middle to a field of view that's almost 40 times bigger, uh, close to 10 square degrees. And of course, that's uh, important for all kinds of surveys, but especially for fast radio bursts, this has turned out to be a very interesting system. <clears throat> now, of course, only a large group of people can build that, so I want to list those names here. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the technical folks, 
Uh, and on the, in the column on the left, you can see the people behind the work that I'm presenting. And there I've tagged the uh, participants uh, that are currently in the channel. So please feel to uh, feel free to uh, reach out to these folks. Now, any FRB talk, I just like starting out with this figure because it doesn't happen often that I get to show uh, a plot that it sums it all up for me, on which are, where on one of the axes there is more than 10 orders of magnitude in it. Huh? Here at the bottom in the ground plane, you can see that in pulse width and in bandwidth, uh, FRBs are very much like pulsars. But of course, in the luminosity scale, we're looking at 10 to the 16 uh, difference in uh, scale. And so we don't already really understand how pulsars shine. And so this continues to mean for me that, uh, that FRBs are really interesting in trying to figure out what these are powered by. So how does Aperitif go about uh, detecting sources like these? So it's summer now, if you went there, Aperitif's in a forest, Westerbrook's in a forest. You can see it's an east-west area, yeah, it's all in one big line. There's uh, 12 dishes that you see here, two would be uh, right behind us. And these, these 25 meter dishes each, you know, together they still form one of the most sensitive interferometers in the world. And in 12 of these dishes, we've installed Aperitif, and those are the wide band receivers that increase the field of view by uh, about a factor of 40, like I was saying. And these make it an excellent service. Now what's neat is that it continues to be an interferometer. And so this also means you can make high resolution beams and you can also make images. To do that though, you need a backend. Our backend is called ARTS, the Aperitif Radio Transient System. It's a completely real-time system that consists of a hybrid supercomputer. When we built it two years ago, it was uh, one of the top 100 in the world. It first has two sets of uh, FPGA-based beam formers that combine the dishes and do the corner turn. And then there's a big GPU cluster right behind it. Uh, we uh, do our RFI excision in real time. Um, and also this GPU cluster uh, uh, powered by the search software called Amber and the deep neural net detection that we perform afterward. It allows us to detect these fast radio bursts in real time. So the data comes in in the uniboards, those you see here. Then uh, there's more internet that goes through these cables than uh, the whole country of the Netherlands uh, needs. So we are one of the biggest data generators in the country. And then in the end, of course, all this data ends up in the, in the five racks of uh, GPU uh, nodes that form the ARTS uh, GPU, the real heart, the searching heart of the, of the uh, ARTS search part. So how do we survey? Uh, there's three things uh, we want to do in alert. We want to detect new sources. We want to then localize them better and we want to try and characterize any known sources. And that's how we come up with the priorities for the field. Of course, uh, it's uh, dishes. And so you can point as long as you want in which direction you want, basically. What we do most is uh, try and target uh, fields with known sources, uh, especially when these are repeaters or new FRBs. We try and localize these sources better and use the new detections. If there are sources that are already pretty well localized, we try and hit these more because we can characterize FRBs like that and still get our new detections. And if uh, there's a, uh, our angles where there aren't many known fields, we target plant fields. And so at the bottom, you can see how we are uh, covering a large part of the Northern sky. Our time fraction for 2021 has uh, decreased a little bit. Currently, really we're on sky one week out of every five. We do about three hour pointings and Aperitif will operate until the end of the year. The operations funding for next year is unclear. So it's been going strong so far. We are very glad uh, that uh, two years ago now we found our first FRB, 190709. Um, it was discovered in the first week of the survey itself. And as we've seen, and as we will see in some of these uh, other talks about uh, uh, survey instrument commissioning, it's a big deal to find the first one. So I was very glad. Uh, it's a very standard by now source, a fluence of about maybe seven Jansky milliseconds. So that puts it roughly at the 50th percentile of the known population in brightness. But you know, what's neat about a system like Westerbork is that we get the instantaneous east-west gradient response. And you can see that here. <coughs> On the left-hand side, with, colored with rainbows, if you will, you can see the broadband response of the uh, Westerbork array. And clearly, the uh, middle, uh, for this broadband detection, you can clearly say that the middle gradient response is the correct one. And so this produces the ellipse on the right. That's roughly our localization for weak sources. 
20 arc seconds, my 30 arc minutes or so. Uh, and generally that's good enough to rule out any host, any bright galaxies as the hosts below Z of uh, 0.6 maybe. Um, if they're farther out, of course, we cannot identify it easily. But as you'll see later, these, these localizations are good enough for mapping all the magneto-ionic material along these narrow pencil line of sets. So that was the first one. We've been going steady so far. Discovered over 20 new FODs. Actually, every about five days of observing, we find a new source. And uh, we're very glad because, you know, that makes us one of the most productive L band servers in the world. We do not only get good rates, we also get interferometric localization, especially in east west direction. And like I was saying, this is good for mapping material. Um, and so we do think that this, this sample of over 20, of two dozen uh, FRBs now, it marks um, yeah, maybe a new phase in FRB surveying where a growing number of bursts can be used to probe our universe huh, of the SKA. So what are our sources like? They're mostly high DM, up, up to a DM of almost 3000. Um, these uh, strengths really show some of what these detections really follow from some of our system, system strengths. We have high time resolution, high frequency resolution. We already talked about a couple of days ago in Slack. Maybe microsecond sampling at uh, less than 200 kilohertz channels. And this means that you can go out to very high DMs. We, uh, most of the FRBs we find are narrow. We don't see a lot of scattering, but we see some. You can see it here in the overview. There's interesting morphologies. We see scattering, we see scintillation. We see quite a few sources that have more than one component. We actually see a few more multi-component sources than we see in the chunk catalog, so that's interesting. Uh, and many of these have polarization. A couple of interesting examples, 191108, for example, is an FRB that we localized uh, because of its high signal to noise to a much smaller ellipse. Uh, five arc seconds by seven arc minutes or so. And this cuts really close to M33 uh, and M31 too. So these are some of our nearest neighbors. And you can see that they uh, travel through the uh, circumgalactic medium of uh, the Andromeda galaxy. And so we find that the plasma in these local group galaxies can really only contribute to about 10% of the dispersion measure of the source. And the DM is about 600. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually add much to the, to the Faraday effect. Um, it's, it has a Faraday rotation of almost 500 radians per square meter, and that's, that's much too large to be explained by the Milky Way or the um, intergalactic medium. And so this does, again, indicate a very dense local magneto-ionic environment in the source-host galaxy. What's interesting and actually unique to this survey is that this uh, time domain survey also included imaging of the field. You can see here uh, um, uh, that uh, the imaging part of Aperitif showed that uh, that we can rule out a persistent radio source like the one that we see in 121102 um, if it was as close as uh, 191108. And um, no persistent radio sources were found in this uh, survey. So it seems that these sources are good. So that's one offs. We also, uh, like I said, uh, find repeaters in uh, a number of our fields. One of the results uh, that Liam Ostrom uh, published last year from 121102 is one of the biggest uh, samples of 121102 bursts. Um, we find about 30 bursts from this uh, repeater, and uh, including two of the brightest that were seen until then. And so we, we find that its, uh, its, its brightness cannot be, simply be a power law. And so we need to think again about the underlying emission mechanism there. We also spent a lot of time on R2, um, almost 300 hours, but we didn't detect it. So this means that those bursts are either very highly clustered or they have a spur of a very steep. Of course, because we are an east-west array, our instantaneous field of view is elongated in one direction. And so if we want to localize repeaters, we have to find them on different angles. And if we do get two or three bursts from repeating FRBs, we can really shrink the localization by a factor of about 50. There's an example uh, at the bottom from R3. Um, and this is really where some of the long tracks in our uh, uh, detections are a benefit. There's one uh, chime uh, repeater that we have so far localized better than the uh, uh, published uh, value, but that's just still from one burst. And what's interesting is that all these new FRBs that I mentioned earlier, 90% uh, of them are from repeater fields. Now, many people, uh, including myself, have been trying to find FRBs not only with uh, Aperitif, as you can see here, but also with LOFAR. Here in the background, you can already see a combined Aperitif LOFAR image from the imaging side of the view. But of course, we never found one. One of the reasons could be 
that a dense electron missed around the FRB source is uh, blocking the low frequency emission. Um, and so uh, we connected the real-time system and aperitif uh, to LOFAR to see if FRBs shine not only at the higher frequencies, but also in the red. We know we can see the 1.4 gigahertz bursts, but potentially we can also see the 150 megahertz bursts. Uh, we targeted mostly FRB uh, 2018-09-16b, so three. You know, it's, it's the 16-day periodic FRB. Um, from the aperitif side, our real-time detection pipeline automatically dumped the full Stokes data. And so that allowed for polarization calibrated uh, profiles. But based on these triggers, we also looked very hard to see if any simultaneous low far bursts survived. And here you can see at the top is the aperitif burst, at the bottom is the simultaneous low far data. They didn't. But then a few days later, when the aperitif periodicity window was over, the low far burst suddenly arrived. And that was really and I vividly remember seeing these plots for the first time. And so we detected 1809-16 at both telescopes, but never at the same time. So just looking at the LOFAR data for a sec, it was the first FRB uh, ever seen with LOFAR. It was very exciting. Um, and so it does mean that for this FRB, there's no dense electron mist around the source or in the host galaxy. And you know that's important for uh, cosmological applications because it does allow you to uh, identify better what purely is the extragalactic EM and use that for the bearing mechanism. If you compare the uh, aperitif data with the low far data, then something interesting shows up. The, you can see it in the plot here on the right. In the green, we have the aperitif data. In the uh, orange, the chime data. And in the red, the low far data. You can see clearly see they're, they're not, uh, cent they're not uh, centered equally. The low frequency burst window is wider and it lags the high frequency uh, burst window. And so for a simple binary wind, you would have expected the opposite, the strong wind. If a strong wind creates the periodic windows, then the 1.4 gigahertz should be wider and not the other way around. And there should be no lag. So that's not it. We do think that magnetar precession is a series of models that can explain the periodicity. But there, of course, some of our data has flat PA. So here it doesn't work so well. Uh, all these have challenges. Uh, synchrotron maser shock models around an ultra long period, isolated magnetar, um, they have, of course, trouble powering other prolific repeaters, but they sure work best for our data set. Uh, this uh, paper uh, appears in uh, Nature in a few weeks. Now, what's remarkable, as you can see in this plot, with fluence at the bottom and right on the left, is that uh, 1809-16b actually emits over 10 times more bursts of certain fluence at 150 megahertz than it does at 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, in general, these detections allow us to put the first uh, bounded FRB all sky rate at 150 megahertz, and we find that this rate is between 3 and 450 FRBs per sky per day. So that's really promising also for low frequency surveys in the future. If you look at some of the aperitive data in more detail, we do find a lot of bursts with a number of components in time frequency space. Uh, the downward drift uh, you can see here, there's up to 12 components in some of these. Check out the paper or take a look at Anya Bilos's uh, poster number 41 in the Gather Town. And we find a, a subpulse drift rate of about 40 minus 40 megahertz per milliseconds in aperitive. And so that's that 10 times larger, larger than the value that, that was seen at 400 megahertz. So to conclude, much of this survey has been carried out in uh, Corona times. And so uh, the original kickoff was uh, one of the last times we actually got together. By now, uh, many of us are behind the screens. I do hope we can uh, make a, a video uh, like this again, uh, including a number of the people that have joined us since and hope you talk to all of them on Slack. Um, but uh, our conclusions are that that, this, that we, the team, were proud of uh, the achievements uh, so far. We detect uh, one FRB every uh, five days of observing. Uh, we've discovered about two dozen uh, one-off FRBs so far with uh, good localization. And the, the combination of those rates with the uh, uh, good localization allows us to see which magnetoionic material lives along these lines of sight, which is important. And of course, some part of the results on repeaters are that our aperitif and LOFAR data together uh, will allow that simple, strong binary winds either cause for uh, the periodicity in uh, repeater FRBs. And that's it. Talk to me on Slack. Thanks.
Thank you to Yuri. Um, so as Yuri said, he's he's uh, he's around, but um, he's he's not able to answer questions live. So um, please post your questions for Yuri on Slack, and um, and he will answer them as as he already has. Uh, so um, thank you to Yuri. We'll move on to our next recorded talk, which is from Vikram Ravi from Caltech on the Deep Synoptic Array. Um, I don't think that Vikram is online, so unless he pops up in the next few minutes, uh, we're going to uh, just play the recorded question and answer from uh, earlier, and uh, and you can ask him questions on Slack. Wherever you are, and um, thanks for tuning into the session. Um, I will be presenting an update on where we are with the Deep Synoptic Array, which is the, to my knowledge, the one and only telescope uh, specifically designed and built with FRBs as the sole um, motivating purpose. And so um, this, uh, as you will see, is going to be hopefully the final report on DSA 110 construction. Um, we had one antenna at this time last year, and in just over a week's time, we will, uh, we will begin a six-month commissioning period for a 64-element deployment of the DSA. Um, this will include 48 antennas in an east-west core, as well as our full complement of 16 outrigger antennas, and this system will be able to deliver localizations to better than plus or minus 1.5 arc seconds on the sky. Now, I've quoted a very conservative sensitivity number here as the sensitivity at the half power point of the beam, um, such that we will be sensitive to roughly 4.2 Jansky millisecond FRBs within a 10 square degree field of view. Um, the full DSA 110, um, all the parts are currently on site. And as we complete a range of projects at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, um, we expect that uh, the full DSA 110 with 110 elements will be completed in early 2022. Um, and before I go on, I also wanted to just, um, just acknowledge how bloody hard this last year has been for you know, for all of us in our own ways. Um, and from our perspective in particular, I want to really emphasize how grateful I am to the DSA team um, on campus, in their homes, um, at OVRO, our observatory as well, for um, turning up to work, um, spending a lot of uh, the last year working one person per building on site. Um, you'll see some photos a little later on of things people have put together working by themselves day after day, as well as now getting out there in, in the California heat and uh, trenching and trenching and trenching and putting out antennas. And so I just wanted to say thank you to the whole DSA team. So what we actually do is we try and build telescopes with specific purposes in mind to deliver focused experiments. The DSA program was kicked off in 2013 by Greg Hellerman with the idea of building a survey telescope, a deep synoptic array to deliver a range of both time domain and continuum survey science. Um, uh, in 2017, we realized that with just 10 four and a half meter antennas, we could and did localize an FRB to its host galaxy. Uh, the technology we developed for the DSA-10 was also turned upside down, very literally, in that this here is a DSA-10 feed and receiver pointed up to detect um, the, the nearest and brightest FRBs in a project led by Chris Bohenek, a graduate student at Caltech, which um, co-detected the burst from the Magnetar SGI 1935. We are now um, in the midst of the DSA-110 project. Um, this is an NSF funded project, uh, which um, will run over the following three years from now. And um, we are in the midst of planning and preparing for the next iteration, which is the DSA 2000, which please feel free to ask more about later, later. So I don't really need to spend much time in the slide. Um, at this meeting in particular, I'm sure we are all convinced that accurate localizations of FRBs are 
critical to delivering a range of interesting science outcomes, both on FIB progenitor science, as well as what we are particularly interested in, which is the effects of propagation along extragalactic site lines, um, looking at the total plasma contents in various environments. And what we're particularly interested in is also the um, uh, plasma and gravitational lensing of these events, as well as the magnetization of extragalactic plasma. And I encourage you to tune into talks by both um, Dana Samad and Liam Connor through the coming days on these topics. Now, the DSA itself, um, what, what, what follows is going to be a very instrumentation focused presentation. Um, so uh, please enjoy um, the uh, various uh, nitty gritty details of how we go about building such a telescope from the ground up. Um, the DSA is conceptualized as an array to localize more than 100 FRBs per year to better than three arc seconds um, in diameter, three arc second diameter localization regions. We've also committed to providing community alerts of these localization regions within 60 seconds, as well as a fully public data archive. Um, here are some of the DSA antennas um, in the midst of winter at our observatory. The idea is that we have a coherently combined core of 95 antennas, uh, which we use for searching. And these trigger the dumping of uh, voltages from the full complement of antennas, including these outrigger antennas spread over two and a half kilometers across the site. And in post-processing of these voltages, we deliver localizations in a standard imaging way. So just to end, um, with the DSA 64 itself, the 64 element deployment that we're beginning commissioning off next week, um, we're simply forming fan beams. 256 beams um, using an east-west array. And the idea is that as the sky drifts overhead, sources drift through, um, like this uh, BO329 plus 54 pulsar drifting through the beams over here, or uh, continuum sources transiting through the beams. Um, and this is what we use as our trigger to record voltages. The end-to-end -end pipeline is currently in a stage where uh, we are um, somewhat confident that if we see an FRB, we will be able to localize it, but that is the purpose of the commissioning period to come. So the antennas themselves, um, they're kind of, they're sort of an evolution of what we did for DSA 10 in that we now have um, elevation only drives that we design and build on site. Um, these are 4.65 4 meter antennas, spin formed aluminum reflectors, and a measured uh, net pointing error of about 0.14 degrees. This is particularly important for um, detections close to the edge of the primary beam and maintaining sensitivity over there. And the unit cost of each antenna, including labor, ends up being about $7,000. Um, here's a little uh, time lapse of one of the antennas putting, being put together um, uh, some months ago. Uh, um, Corey and Tommy over here take about, uh, I want to say just under a day to go from a box to a reflector. Um, you can see them here sort of happily tightening away the, bo the bolts. I'm going to skip forward a little bit um, to where we actually use our extremely sophisticated template to um, confirm the parabolic shape. Um, we keep going with this um, and eventually you will see Corey kind of add the feed legs. Um, the feed legs themselves are actually transparent. Um, we chose a specific type of fiberglass that has the least um, um, reflections for radio waves. And um, we then, um, after putting it all together, load it onto this custom transport trailer and take it out to the um, array. Um, the receivers are really our, uh, are one of our pride and joys. Um, Sandy Weinreb and his group have designed these uh, room temperature LNAs that deliver um, less than seven Kelvin noise um, in real operating conditions. These are coupled to a custom um, uh, choke ring feed, um, which has a six inch waveguide at the back of it. Um, these things at the front are literally from a company called Fat Daddios, um, as some people have seen in various Food Network shows. Um, 
And uh, the, these feeds um, together with the dish surface yield an aperture efficiency that is somewhat um, over 65% at zenith. Um, our measured t -cis, um, as you will see later, ends up being something like 25 Kelvin um, on sky. Um, the infrastructure that um, um, infrastructure work led by Morgan Cather on site um, needs to serve each antenna with two single mode fibers as well as power. Um, so we have internet at each antenna as well as RF over fiber transmission of the RF signals. Um, you can see here we have we, we have our own um, trenching equipment that allows us to um, dig into the into the sand over there. Um, I'll emphasize that we also um, make use and employ. Uh, tribal monitors for the local um, Paiute uh, tribe in Big Pine, California, to um, make sure that if um, we were to dig up any artifacts, they are dealt with appropriately. Um, we then, uh, having um, dug the uh, trenches, um, the outrigger antennas um, have these little drinks cooler boxes uh, for the pool boxes, um, which feed the antennas. The antenna boxes themselves contain various kinds of electronics, including um, a lab jack uh, plus custom interface board for monitor and control. These are all, of course, uh, remotely steerable. The fibers themselves are terminated in a breakout rack in a central building. And um, Corey and, uh, and Tommy, not pictured here, um, spend about two months sitting in this enclosed room um, in the basement, splicing fiber. Um, all four E6 fibers were terminated over that time. Um, it's currently, uh, over 40 degrees C uh, every day at Owens Valley and the trenching, um, although the DSA trenching is complete, um, trenching is underway for the Owens Valley long wavelength array. Um, and so we take um, many breaks as needed. Um, Roxy pictured here, this is, this is her break time. Um, in terms to continue the infrastructure um, theme, um, we also developed a custom monitoring control system based on a distributed key value store called XCD. And the idea here is that it's a central store that is shared among all um, uh, services that service the various hardware elements. And XCD acts as both a control system, so such that if you update a key, everything can see the update as well as a monitor system such that things can update keys and snapshots of the etcd database are used to feed an influx uh, monitor database. And so we find that the system is quite performant and very easy to scale to the full um, uh, complement of hardware components. Um, we use this to control the antennas. Um, we use to ingest weather information. We use this to control the digital backend. We even use to trigger voltage dumps for FRBs. Um, Everything is controlled by the central etcd server, um, and we and we find this to be quite a um, quite a useful solution. Um, and the and the way that um, it's able to very easily connect things like Influx and Grafana for visualization, um, really we find that incredibly helpful as well. So I strongly recommend that anyone looking to find such a solution explores explores this. Um, the digital backend itself um, is. Um, complete and um, installed. And uh, Mark Hodges spent um, something like four months of the pandemic uh, installing and building this uh, system by, by himself in, in um, one of the buildings on site. Um, everything, including um, the sort of meat locker curtains um, to the fiber trays, to um, installing all these boxes, to actually carting every single um, server down and um, putting it in its place, uh, the lot. Um, in terms of uh, the hardware, we make use of 40 of these uh, SNAP-1 boards developed by NRAO in the Casper collaboration. Um, these uh, make use of 8-bit ADCs and implement a PFB and requantization stage. These boards then feed uh, the servers over these um, 40 gigabit Ethernet switches. And then we have 16 capture servers that capture the data. Um, we do a full n squared cross correlation as well as beam forming, and then implement a second stage corner turn to feed the um, search servers, which then perform the FRB searching and triggering as well. Um, in terms of performance, um, I'm not going to say very much at all at this stage, except that our preliminary performance measurements 
are that we are beating spec by at least um, a few tens of percent. Our um, specification for the per antenna system equivalent flux density was about 10,200 Jansky. And as measured in this plot here, which shows the SEFD versus frequency for the first complement of, uh, I think this is the first 10 antennas, um, we find that we are well below that 10,200 Jansky number. Um, and as I said before, our typical T-CIS is about 25 Kelvin with an aperture efficiency of about 0.65. We're also being very careful to um, develop ways to characterize the phase errors within the primary beam in order to be confident in our localization and ability to calibrate using sources that are separated within the primary beam. Um, so far, we find that our phase errors are relatively good um, in that they're within about two degrees across the full um, half power beam width and phases from calibrator to calibrator are typically within plus or minus five degrees. Um, and so this work has largely been led by Dana Samad and Bada Uzgul, postdocs here at um, Caltech. And I should also give a particular mention to Dana as well for having led and continuing to lead the overall commissioning effort of, of the DSA. Um, in terms of software, um, we have a very high level of code reuse um, and an emphasis on trying to use portable data formats. Um, I've listed some of the many packages that we use within the DSA, and so I also want to um, extend a thank you to those who um, contributed their development. Um, some of the new developments that we have um, implemented include um, things like multi-threaded packet capture, um, a tensor core implementation of the beamformer, um, our um, second stage corner turn, which we built into PSR data, as well as RFI flagging work led by uh, Greg Helborg, and I've listed the, the core software team up here. Um, in terms of post real time processing or quasi real time, um, there's um, various stages of candidate clustering, vetting, and localization, calibration, and system health pipelines. Um, and this is um, a, certainly an ongoing effort that will be commissioned over the coming months. And so just to finish up, uh, I want to reiterate that uh, this represents a final report on the DSA 110 construction. Um, we had one antenna at this time last year, and we we're about a week away from beginning a six month commissioning period of the 64 element deployment. Um, and the full DSA 110 is expected to be completed in early 2022. And I will leave you with this video of um, what the site looks like as of now. I was, I was hoping to show a webcam, but then unfortunately the link's a bit slow, um, but this is representative enough. Thanks. So Jason, have we got the recording of the Q&A? Yeah, we do. Um, I will play that. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Vikram. Um, all right, there's a question from Chris Phillips. It says, is the code for the tensor core beamformer publicly available? If so, can you post the link? Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, DSA 110 on GitHub. Absolutely, and I'm happy to um, I'm happy to send you more details if, if you'd like. Great, um, Matthew Bell says, "How many kilowatts is the system?" <laughs> That's a great question. We haven't actually measured it in um, in, in in anger, I suppose. But um, the typical uh, power usage per server is at about um, 500 to 600 watts, and we have uh, 24 servers running. Um, that's the main uh, power draw. The antennas themselves are draw next to nothing uh, in, in normal usage because motors are typically off. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, we have the capacity, we have air conditioning capacity for about uh, 30 kilowatts. Uh, so a bunch of things coming in. Great, because we have lots of time for questions. Um, <laughs> Keith, comment which I, I second one of his comments. I wish I had your SEFD problems. Also, what's the extra stuff on the DSA 2000 antennas? I think he means that shielding, which I was curious about too. Yeah, so let me, um, let me uh, revert in 
to the to that. Um, here we go. So right. So this is um. Uh, I, I didn't really include any backup uh, DSA two thousand slides, and so I'm happy to provide more details offline. But um, the uh, idea is that we want two levels of shielding. Um, there's a there's one one um part of the sort of the the, the purely cylindrical part is intended to as partly strength um and also to stop uh cross talk between antennas and then the second part which is more sort of uh not really a reflector it's more of a ground shield so we've actually got it it looks like it's actually a two-stage uh, it looks like a two-part thing but they have two separate uh um, requirements excellent um, there's a question by Adam Deller. Why is the coherent core of 95 antennas laid out as a T rather than one contiguous block, either one line or a rectangle? How is the Northern Spur added into the fan beams, if at all? Yeah, great question. So um, the T is entirely for historical purposes. Um, this was the site of the Ovro millimeter array, um, which had this beautiful uh, coplanar uh, T-shaped concrete infrastructure with um, trenches already dug. And so um, I guess, I, as you can sort of see in the final slide, which I'll go back to, um, you can see the 10 meter antennas um, still on the T. You can see sort of the concrete over here. Um, yeah, that's the main reason uh, for that. In terms of how we actually combine it, um, we're um, planning to go ahead without fan beams altogether and move to an image plane search. Right. Um, still lots of questions rolling in. So can DSA 64 and later the DSA 110 be used in combination with the EOVSA for FOB localization? I believe the latter also covers the L band. That was from someone named Hari. Yeah, great question, actually. So I'm going to fall, fast forward a little bit to show you one of the EOVSA antennas. Here we go. That's good enough. Um, so this is one of the EOVSA antennas. Um, it is about uh, one and a half meters across. Uh, and so the answer is no, it's, it's a short answer. Um, there's one caveat to that, which we haven't fully explored yet, which is I'm gonna try and zoom to the right uh, location. Here we go, that's good enough. Um, so this antenna over here, which is a 27 meter dish um, built, by, built by John Bolton um, prior to him returning to Australia. Um, that is also part of EOVSA. Um, EOVSA is of course the Owens Valley uh, solar array used for sun imaging. Um, we could imagine a scenario where this 27 meter antenna is folded in. Um, it's only used for about two hours a day, but we haven't explored that yet. Great. Um, what is the DA, DSA 2000 budget? I <laughs> you can answer live, but... Uh... Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, man, who, who asked that just so I... Oh, um, Timothy, sorry, Timothy Bateman. Oh, great. Hi, Tim. Um, yeah, so the um, the total budget is, um, I don't have the slide with the breakdown here, but I think I might have included it in a talk I gave the ATNF. Um, the total budget is of order 100 million, a little bit over, um, including, um, uh, including some years of operation, if I remember correctly. Um, I'm going to pick, I think, one more question. Um, this is from Jason Hessels. Can you give us a feeling for how large the phase variations would need to be across the primary beams to have a significant influence on localization accuracy in your case? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, uh, as, as um, some may remember with the DSA-10 um, localization, um, we struggled a little bit with the um, with the fact that we actually had what we thought were significant phase variations across the beam. Um, these were of order um, 15 degrees from half power point to half power point. Uh, and this actually necessitated, uh, because, because we simply did not have time to characterize them in detail, this necessitated calibration using source at the same location within the primary beam as where any detection was made. Um, and so I would say 15 degrees is extremely significant and needs to be carefully characterized. Um, much less than that is, of course, preferable. Um, 
we, we need to, we haven't fully uh, characterized um, exactly how all the errors propagate um, within the um, array, because of course, some antennas are more important than others if they're more on more extended baselines, for example. But um, that is definitely work we need to do over the coming, over the coming months. All right, I'm going to move on to the next talk. Thanks so much, Vikram. Thanks. Um, there's a couple more, more questions. I... Thanks, Brian. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. All right. So yeah. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shetas Agarwal. I'm a final year PhD student at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at West Virginia University. And I'll be talking about comprehensive search and analysis tools for FRPs. So let's begin. So any FRP pipeline can be broadly divided into uh, these three steps. First is the data taking step, where we use any a radio telescope to observe some source or, an, or just sky and uh, record some data. Then we use our favorite search software to search that data for FRBs. Uh, maybe we also use a classifier to classify uh, some candidates. And then uh, finally, once we have detected FRB bursts or uh, bursts from any FRB, then we use some analysis tools to extract signs out of those or extract properties of uh, those FRBs. So in this talk, I'll talk about some search and analysis tools, which we have developed for FRBs. For search, I'll be talking about uh, your unified reader, fetch, and uh, clustering. Uh, and for analysis, I'll be talking about worst fit, uh, FRBPA, and banded incompleteness analysis. So let's dive right in. Uh, your unified reader, or your, is a Python framework to read, write, and process data without worrying about the data format. Uh, it's purely written in Python, and it has functions and classes for most single-purpose uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, currently, it can be used to read, write, uh, filter bank, and uh, read, write, filter bank, and PSR fits format, or, or convert between these two. Or you can also use it to write PSR data. Uh, here's the link of the GitHub repository. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, also, uh, all of these tools, which I'll be discussing uh, in this talk, have been very extensively documented. and we have tried to make sure that they are rigorously tested so that they work as uh, we expect them to. So let's look at some of the tools uh, which are present within Unified Reader uh, itself. Uh, the very first thing you can look at is your viewer, which as the name suggests, can be used to visualize your data. So here I'm just showing a, a sample cutout or sample screenshot from your viewer interface. Uh, this is just data from some random observation from 0.38 to 0.9 seconds. And uh, as you can see on the top, you can see the uh, frequency average time series. On the right, you can see the time average band pass. Uh, you can see, obviously, see this, uh, the, the frequency time data. Uh, you can also see some statistics either on the plot or it also reports some statistics in the logging. You can visualize RFI flagging. You can also de-disperse your data and just visually look at pulses if you want. So this is just to explore the data. Uh, next is our, your RFI mask. So in Unified Reader, we have implemented two RFI mitigation algorithms, sample filter and spectral kurtosis filter. And you can use either or both of those with respective input parameters. You can use your RFI mask to, twe uh, to tweak these input parameters and see how uh, this RFI flagging is affecting your data and also generate an RFI mask, which uh, a channel mask, which you can then uh, pass it on to the search software of your choice. Uh, next is uh, your writer. So uh, within your, you can convert from one data format to the other. And by using this writer class, we have uh, made it pretty easy. So using just four lines of code, you can actually convert from uh, fits of filter bank format to either fits of filter bank format uh, using the same uh, just functions. So here I'm showing a simple example of using this uh, fix file and converting it into fill or fix file, just four lines of code. Uh, once the data has been read by your and uh, passed on to this writer object, you have all the functionality to uh, select the number of spec uh, spectra you want to write, select the number of uh, channels you want to use, which channels you want to actually write in your data. You can even do uh, you can even do RFI flagging, zero beam subtraction while the data is actually being converted. Uh, and next, uh, finally, is your Heimdall, which is which you can use to do an end-to-end -end Heimdall search on any data, be it filter bank or PSR fits. And this is because the data is actually read by your with a unified interface and then passed on to data buffers from where it is then passed on to Heimdall. So using this, you can directly run Heimdall on PSR fits. And as I earlier mentioned, because the data is being read by your, you have all the functionality I listed in the previous slide. So you can do on the fly RFI mitigation, you can provide a custom channel mask, uh, you can do zero DM subtraction, 
Uh, you can even do sub-banded searches because you can select the range of channels you want to search on. And obviously you can set any of those Heimdall parameters from within this uh, your Heimdall call. But once you, have, uh, once you have searched your data for candidates, you have obtained a lot of candidates. Now you want to figure out which candidates are FRB and which are RFI. For that, uh, we have developed Fetch, which is a set of deep learning models for FRB classification. It's telescope and frequency agnostic, uh, which was done by carefully designing its pre-processing and training strategy. And in the past two years, Fetch has been used to, uh, to discover a lot of repeat bursts from different repeaters. For example, 1809-16, the galactic FRB, 121102, 17, 19, and uh, this very beautiful plot uh, of uh, ultra wideband receiver from Parks, 90, uh, observation of 190711, and Fetch was used to detect this one uh, as well. It has also been used to detect a non and uh, so far non repeater, 190614D. Uh, this was using VLA. So next up is clustering. So as we all know, uh, different search search algorithms search at a trial space of DM and BIP to detect the candidates. And you basically search at brute force values of DM and bits and just see where the candidate crosses the signal to my threshold. Uh, but any real event or any RFI event itself can trigger, this, trigger the pipeline at multiple values in this trial space. So for example, if you had a real FRB or a real pulse from Pulsar, it might actually trigger your pipeline uh, for at hundreds and thousands of candidates. And I'm just visualizing that in this plot on the top for a dummy real fast configuration where I'm on the x-axis is the injected signal to noise of uh, a, a simulated FRB and the y-axis shows the number of candidates the pipeline might get triggered at. So as we can see, even for a moderately high signal to noise candidate, uh, it might generate tens to hundreds of candidates. And this, might, this can very easily overwhelm the post-processing system because we might have to do classifications, visualizations, and all sorts of post-processing steps on that. So we want to cluster all of them together, uh, visualizing it in a different way. Uh, and just to add, with real fast, we also get relative sky positions. So we have DM and time along with the uh, sky position information, uh, all the four features for each candidate. So here I'm just showing candidates from six injected uh, transients uh, within the real fast pipeline, generated thousands of candidates, and we want to cluster all of them into these six uh, nice clusters. So to do that, we actually developed a robust clustering analysis to compare eight different clustering uh, algorithms listed here. Uh, and uh, to do that, we uh, designed a custom metric uh, called score. And this custom metric made sure uh, that we minimize the number of clusters while also making sure that the clusters are pure. Uh, whenever we have a lot of candidates or for, for all the candidates they're getting from each search. So what I mean by that is we want to make sure that no RFI gets leaked into an FRB cluster, no FRB gets leaked into an RFI cluster, and we do not miss FRB candidates uh, because if the FRBs get leaked into RFI, we might never find it. We might never recover it from our pipeline. And what we found is that using all of the four features shown here in, in black gives us the highest value of score, which is good. But also using just sky position is definitely better than just using DM time, which has been conventionally used. Um, this has also been visualized on this left plot, where we use the same database of FRB and RFI candidates and trained a random forest classifier uh, to identify FRBs and RFI and asked it to just give us the important score of each of the four features. So L and M are again the sky position, DM and time are what we are familiar with. And it clearly says that the sky position gives much more, uh, is very important when we have to identify uh, these FRB clusters versus RFI. So now let's look at some analysis tools, starting from BurstFit, which is a Python framework to do spectrotemporal modeling of FRBs. Again, it's purely written in Python. And a good thing about BurstFit is that it has a user-defined uh, you can provide user-defined functions to model the profile spectra in the spectrogram. So we do have some inbuilt functions for profile, for example, a Gaussian profile or a Gaussian convolving exponential and so on, and spectra like Gaussian or multiple Gaussians and so on. But uh, you can provide it any Python function uh, to replace that native uh, profile or spectra function and burst fit framework will take care of a uh, whole of the fitting procedure on its own. It starts with using SciPy's curve fit to, pro to get an initial estimate of fitting parameters, and, but then it's possible to define a custom likelihood and then do a full-scale MCMC to obtain the posteriors of all the fitted parameters. On the right, I'm just showing uh, a sample output of burst fit. This top left plot uh, is a three-component component, uh, uh, three component pulse from FRB 12.1.02, and this right one, the top right one is just a fitted, uh, profile, uh, fitted model from burst fit. Uh, and uh, here is the GitHub repository for BurstFit. Do check it out. 
Um, these are just two more examples of FRB 121102, which we obtained, uh, which we recently published. So uh, these, the, the first column shows the original data, the second column shows the model, and then the third column is the residual after we have subtracted model from the data. And as we can see, this residual looks like noise, and we confirm it by doing some statistical tests. Uh, and as I mentioned, because we do a full-scale MCMC on all the parameters, we obtain uh, this nice, beautiful corner plot where we have posterior distribution of all the parameters as well as the correlation plots. So this is just an example for this uh, B67 burst. After we have obtained the times of arrivals of all the bursts using burst fit or any other procedure, we can uh, we want to search for periodicity analysis because we know that two repeaters uh, R1 and R3 now show periodic activity. So you, you can use FRBPA to search for periodic activity in repeaters. Uh, it has three methods. Uh, the plots from these three methods are nicely shown in this plot on the right. You can also use it to visualize periodic activity uh, as we can see on this plot on the left. Uh, next uh, is the band incompleteness analysis. So uh, we know that uh, the best way to determine the completeness of any search pipeline is through injections. And by that, I mean that you inject simulated transients at various values of uh, DMs and widths and other properties and try to see what, how, what percentage of those transients you're able to recover. Try to find out where your pipeline is uh, less sensitive or what kind of transients you're missing. So in, in this and the upcoming few slides, I'll talk about how banded nature of bursts can cause an observational bias. Uh, this is because we might not be sensitive to weak bursts that primarily lie outside our observing band. Uh, let's take an example uh, to understand it better. So let's say, uh, we, let's say these, all of these different curves are actually spectra and this x-axis is frequency. A red shaded region is our observing band. And we are, we are assuming that the spectra of, uh, let's say any repeater is modeled using a Gaussian. Uh, I've made all, around 200 spectra on this plot and the energy of these spectra is modeled uh, from, is drawn from a power law distribution. So let's say we run, run a search on it with a constant fluence threshold uh, and we detect these blue bursts. So as we can see, most of these blue bursts actually lie within our observing band, which is expected because most of the signal is present there. But we also detect this, these two really bright bursts, which are mostly outside our band, but there was enough signal within our band to actually cross the fluence threshold. And these green ones are the ones which we missed. We did not detect those. So obviously we will not detect the very weak ones, but we also missed out on, missed these moderately strong bursts, which were primarily outside our band. So this would lead to uh, an incompleteness, which will depend on how the burst, burst spectra varies across the frequency. Three minutes. Thanks. Uh, and then the other incompleteness uh, factors and due to the signal to noise calculation, uh, due to the fluence calculation. Typically signal to noise is used to calculate the fluence, but that might heavily underestimate our fluence estimate. Uh, let's take the same example and look at four bursts. So these three bursts, uh, the, this top number here shows a fraction of the burst within the band. And these three bursts clearly lie within the band. And if we estimate the fluence using signal to noise, then that would be perfectly fine. We will get the intrinsic value correctly. But if we use the intrinsic, uh, if we use this, in band, in signal band, uh, the, the, the signal in the band to estimate its fluence, then we'll be heavily underestimating it. Moreover, if we estimate the burst bandwidth using just the signal present in the band, then again, we'll be underestimating it. So that might lead to another bias. So uh, a, a way to, to solve this is to fit a Gaussian model of the spectra to estimate the intrinsic fluence and bandwidth of the bursts. So let's quickly look at uh, what these observational biases can do to our power law distribution of energies. So again, using the same example, we had some burst spectra, uh, we ran a search on it, and then we made their power law distrib uh, energy distribution. This red curve shows the interesting distribution of energies with a slope of minus 1.5. And this green curve is actually what we will get if you signal to noises to determine the energies of the bursts. And uh, I have not included any other observational bias here. There is no DM effect or width effect. It's purely due to this band incompleteness, which I've, been, uh, which I've talked about. And you can fit a three power law model and then only you might be able to recover the intrinsic distribution of the bursts. Uh, but we can do better. We can use, we can fit for, for the burst energies and use this and get this blue curve, but that also is not enough because we are still missing out on a lot of bursts which are outside our band. So if we only use the in-band bursts, which are primarily within our band represented here in cyan, then we'll get the cyan curve on the bottom uh, represented by fit in band. And this actually gives us the uh, energy slope, which is much more representative of the intrinsic distribution. If our energy, if our fluence threshold is worse, as shown in this left plot, then both of these uh, curves get even worse because we're missing out on a much more number of bursts. But again, if you using in-band bursts give us a relatively good estimate of the intrinsic distribution. 
Uh, now, uh, just very, very quickly, I'll go over this project wherein we uh, detected 133 bursts from three hours of Arecibo observations uh, of FRB 12102. This is a very dense sample of 12102 uh, published so far. Uh, we have recently published it on archive, here's the link. And we used all of the uh, analysis tools which I've discussed so far in this presentation. So your fetch, FRB, PA, burst, fit, and band completeness. Here are just six snapshots of six bursts. Uh, we also did the typical repeater analysis. So we did the burst rate estimation, wait time, periodicity search, and cumulative energy distribution. So using wait time distribution, we found that our, uh, the, the, the distribution shows log normal distribution with a peak at low wait times. Uh, the peak was again at around 70 to uh, 75 seconds, consistent with other publications, did not detect any short term periodicity. And using in band bursts, we found uh, a corner because they are probably incomplete because we could not do injection analysis. And our high energy slope is consistent with uh, what other people have published. All of the notebooks for all of this analysis are also publicly available. The summary slide. Uh, I've discussed a lot of tools. Your can be used for search, visualization, flagging, and conversion. Fla uh, fetch can be used for classifying FRBs and RFI. Clustering, uh, we developed a robust clustering metric, uh, and sky location improves clustering performance. Uh, burst fit can be used to model spectrogram, band incompleteness to bias due to banded nature of repeaters. Uh, FRB PA to search for periodic activity in repeaters. And I recommend you to check out the uh, Petabyte Project GitHub repository for all of the softwares I've listed in this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Shatej. Questions for Shatej? So what do you think is the, uh, is sort of the, the next big software sort of challenge or, or, or tools that are needed, having seen the sorts of results that are coming in from all the different surveys? Um, so one thing could be a search, uh, a search tool, which can, so there can be two things, actually. One thing could be uh, uh, an end-to-end -end search pipeline, which also includes sub-banded searches optimally. So currently, if we have to use Heim, uh, a search tool like Heimdall, it was not designed with sub-banded searches in mind. So if you want to do sub-banded searches, you have to rerun Heimdall on different chunks, frequency chunk data, and then get candidates and then see where the overlap is and so on. Uh, a really nice thing would be a, a search tool which can do this sub-banded searches uh, by you know, copying the data over to the GPU of the whole band, run sub-banded searches, only return the, uh, return the candidates from those different sub-banded searches, do the clustering and overlapping from different bands, uh, and return, directly returns the output of those sub-banded searches. So that is one thing. Another thing could be an end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning based system which directly uses the native time resolution data and classifies it, uh, searches and classifies it for FRBs. So we just skip the two steps of using searching and classification. We directly just use a single machine learning classifier to search and classify the FRBs that on the native time resolution data. Thanks. Any other questions for Shitij? Uh, yeah, so Jason has asked the question, could the time variable energy distribution for FRB 12.1102 seen by FAST be largely due to the burst drifting in and out of the observing band? Um, yeah, I, I'll have to think about it a little bit. I was looking into that data set and uh, yeah, I, I, I forgot to mention that the, the paper reporting the band incompleteness analysis is going to be out on archive soon. So I definitely recommend you to check that out and I will be discussing a part of analysis of that in that paper. So maybe just wait for that for a day or two. All right, any other final questions? Okay, well, thank you, Shitij, for your talk. Um, uh, please ask Shitij any other questions on Slack. Uh, and thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, there were some really um, fantastic results and, and thinking presented in this session. So we are uh, finished now. We'll resume in, um, in just under uh, two hours with plenary session 9A. And uh, uh, Natasha Hurley-Walker um, has had some pe people suggest that they chat more about her source in Gathertown right now. So uh, if you'd like to talk more uh, to Natasha or to anybody else, uh, the Gathertown uh, room is open. So thank you again. And uh, we will uh, see you in a couple of hours.